that it would be like me. And actually, at one point, I, when I was writing this book, I actually because I, I love that book, I do Christopher think. and His Kind, it's brilliant. And I actually thought I would go. Alan went to blah blah blah. One day, Alan came home from school. Yeah. La la la. And it just didn't ring, sit well with me to do it in that in that. Third I've tried exactly way. the same. Thing. You have. Uh, and somehow he pulls it off so beautifully. Yeah. And it, because way, it develops the notion of it was another person. Yes. Somebody I'm remembering. And reflects on himself. Yeah. But he, but in a way, that's what like what Cabaret is like the, in terms of the the whole way the, the gay stuff was that when at first, because uh, Joe Masteroff, who wrote the, the scenes, the book, in between the songs, uh, spoken about this, that, you know, now there's, it's, you know, basically the Chris character, the Cliff character, is based on Christopher Isher. He's kind of a, he's kind of like a gay or bisexual man who goes and kind of falls in love by chance with this, uh, you know, crazy girl. And they, she's pregnant with somebody else, but she might t he might take his, uh, be the father. And they weren't able to, when they first did it in the 60s, that wasn't at all the story. There was, there was no, and so gradually over the years, the, the book, the libretto, if you like, of the, of the show has changed, kind of to reflect what is um, acceptable uh, or palatable for audiences at different times. And, and actually, I think what's really interesting about doing, having, doing it now and having done it 16 years ago is that 16 years ago, the whole sexy stuff of the, of the production, I think, overshadowed. It was too prominent and was too sensational and, and took away, or not took away, but kind of didn't let the, 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 the more dark side of the production come through. And now I think we're at a stage in our evolvement uh, or evolution, I think is the word, that people are people think, well, that's sexy, that's fun, but I'm not so fixated on it that I don't get the darkness over here. So I think actually now... This is the best time that it could That's be nice to do to this, this, this show, to tell the yeah. story. Um, is the, the pink triangles are still with the yellow stars, though, in the final scene? Yes, the right? last image is me with a pink triangle and a yellow. yellow. And that's actually quite disturbing because I realize it's a lot, young people don't, don't actually know what, know what means. that means. And, the, the, you know, the concentration camp pajamas, they don't actually know what that signifies. And... I find that really disturbing. I have to say, I find like you know the standard of education in this country is so poor, yeah. and, and uh, it's it's a, it's really apparent in, in, at moments like that when you think, you know, fairly recent history, huge, hugely important things that have formed the world since, since in the last sixty or seventy years that people don't understand those. I find that so uh, it, it, it jars me, you know. Yeah, you'd think they would even remember Schindler's List exactly. or something. I said to someone, we need another Schindler's List yeah. for this generation to know what all that means. Isn't that awful? Yeah. Although, you know that thing, I'm, I, I was talking to someone the other day, like, you know when you can't remember something, and you say, oh, Google it. Yeah. And you just find out like that. And I, and much as I hate when people bring their phones to the table and everything, I think it's so rude. Um, thanks. <laughs> but sometimes it's actually really useful to go, it was... Karen Black in that film in 1917. <laughs> um, but I, I actually think that if we didn't have, if something happened and the internet went away, you know, a nuclear holocaust or something, I suppose, um, I think we would regain that part of our brain. I think, we, I think we're just, we've just got lazy. We don't have to really think back to Karen Black and then something to do, we can just Google it. I think we could, I really do believe we could get that again. I hope so. I hope it is so. certainly handy before a dinner party too, when you're thinking, "What was the name of the husband?" Of <laughs> yeah, the exactly. Son, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. want to be polite, it would, can actually. Then you mustn't let them work see in your your show them a photo of your dog or something, and you, they, you go to the wrong page and they see their name and their person's. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> yeah. Are you well? I know. I know how you feel, but you are. You you were for yes. You were. Uh, you wanted the separation of Scotland from. Britain. The, yeah, I did. Britain. It's very, very for yes. I mean, I find it it's difficult to describe if you don't, you know, well, I mean, I'm sure you're all quite clever people, but, and you're abreast of the basic tenets of the, of the, of the thing, but for me, I realised when it didn't happen, and I was very involved, I spoke at the launch of the S yes campaign in 2012, and I actually went on one of my days off from Cabby, like, you know, on Monday like this, I flew to Scotland and campaigned just a, 10 days before 
the vote. And the very day that I was there, they, they announced the, um, the No Campaign announced these um, uh, series of uh, like a package of extra powers for the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, which they said, if you vote no, we will give you these things, which is basically kind of independence, but not really full independence, yeah. but fiscal, uh, um, what's the word, um, independence, I suppose. And of course, um, immediately after the vote went no, they started to renege on those promises and there's all these conditions. And so actually, but, but, although it's terrible, and of course, like, duh, what did you think was going to happen, people? That's the whole point. We're trying to vote yes to stop these people, these awful people yeah. messing around with us. Um, what it's meant is that there's so many angry people who voted no because of that, and the yes campaign is kind of um, ongoing. And it's and, and and really the level of political engagement in Scotland is so uh, exciting, and I think people are, you know, ho holding them to task about these promises, but also the ongoing. A lot of people have. And actually, there was a thing the other day that the Labour Party in Scotland, which was always, I voted, I grew up voting Labour, Labour you know, we, what we, else would you do? Um, and, and the Labour Party, because it sided with the Conservative Party in this, in the, in the referendum, has lost so much uh, support and confidence that right now it, there would be like a landslide in, the, in, in, in terms of the Scottish MPs going to Westminster. Um, for the Scottish National Party. So even more grist to the mill that there will be another re referendum soon. So in a way, when something bad happens and you're treated really poorly again and promises are broken, it can actually be a positive thing, you know. Which is like, in, uh, getting back to my book, actually, if I may, in a rather Good. nice segue that I say in it, and I do truly believe this, that sometimes people do you a favour when they remove themselves from your life. That when my dad, when my dad didn't, my brother and I went to confront my dad when I was 28 or 29 about him, you know, hitting us and stuff and abusing us. And we asked him to still be a part of our lives if he wanted to, we'd be willing to, and but he needed to engage with us as, a, as another adult and not for us to do duty visits every once in a while. And he, he, he didn't ever get contact us again. And so, but actually... Yeah, the offer of intimacy was... Too, too scary. Yeah. And also, I, but he was doing us a favor. He did all of us. He, I'm sure he was happier. We certainly were happier. Yeah. My mum was happier. It was, it was actually, and I think sometimes it's okay to say not having someone in your life is better. And that should, you shouldn't think that, a, a family member, I mean, you know, sometimes you think, oh, yeah. that's a terrible thing to say. But actually, if you're all happier and, and there's not so much strife, that's... Biology doesn't get a pass. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, why don't you, speaking of your book, um, another vodka, could you thanks. read us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah, really. Could you read us a little bit? Uh, yes. I'll read you um, a wee bit. Hang on. So, uh, okay. I'll just read it. This is, it goes back and forward between that summer when I, all these things happened to me and uh, to my childhood, and, uh, and this is one of the then sections. Memory is so subjective. We all remember in a visceral, emotional way, and so even if we agree on the facts, what was said, what happened, where and when, what we take away and store from that moment, what we feel about it, can vary radically. I really wanted to show that it wasn't all bad in my family. I tried so hard to think of happy times we all had together, times when we had fun, when we laughed. In the interests of balance, I even wanted to be able to describe some instances of kindness and tenderness involving us all. But I just couldn't. I spoke to my brother about this. He drew a blank too. We remember happy times with our mum, safe, quiet times. As a whole family, honestly, there is not one memory from our childhoods that is not clouded by fear or humiliation or pain. And that's not to say that moments of happiness did not exist. It's just that cumulatively they have been erased by the dominant feelings that colour all of our childhood recollections. I can remember us in a Chinese restaurant in a nearby town. We hardly ever ate out together, so when we did, it was a memorable occasion. 
but there is something nagging too about my memories of that place, something that jabs at my heart when I think of it. I know that at least once in the few times we went there as a family, I must have been hit for some flaw my father perceived, must have tried to hide my tears and humiliation from other diners. We surely had some meals that were free of his mood swings and his tongue and the back of his hand, but they don't stand out for me. I can remember when I was very little, in the living room, at least four or five years old, playing horsey with my father. I see him balancing me on the foot of his crossed leg as he watched TV and him bouncing me up and down to my squeals of delight. I remember being genuinely filled with joy in those moments. But as soon as a memory like that settles for too long in my mind, another darker one forces it to slide to the side. I see a freezing wintry afternoon in the sawmill yard. I am on the red bike I was given for Christmas, and my father has decided that today is the day that I must ride it without training wheels. To this moment, I have never once tried to ride without them. There is ice and snow on the ground, and I see my father taking the training wheels off and pushing me down the driveway too fast. Every time he does so, I panic and fall off, and soon he gets frustrated with my failure and pulls my trousers down and slaps me really hard on my bare bum. It is so cold I have no feeling in my toes and barely in my fingers. It is sore for me to sit down on the seat. I am scared. I am crying. And yet somehow my father thinks I am going to be able to achieve what he has decided I must do. Each time I fall, despite my pleas and promises that I will practice and be able to ride without the training wheels soon, I am bent over his knee, feel the blast of freezing air around my genitals, and then severe painful slaps to my behind. I don't remember how it ended. What I do remember is my mum washing me and getting me ready for bed in front of the living room fire later that night, and her gasping as she saw the ring of blue, black and purple bruises that had appeared. My father came in to say goodbye before he went out for the night, and my mother admonished him for his handiwork. He's all right, he said, running a comb through his hair as he looked in the mirror. You've gone too far, Ali, my mum replied as he disappeared out the door. I have a cheerier bit for later. Though. Seems wrong to say that that's beautiful, but that's that's beautiful writing. Thanks, I almost did. Um, I thought that about. Uh, I was aware of you as a writer when I saw the anniversary party. Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> Such an amazing. Well, you directed as well. You and Je was it Jennifer? Jennifer Jason? and I. Jennifer Jason and I directed and produced and wrote it. For those of you who don't know, it's basically a group of of y young people. I guess they're certainly young to me now. Yeah, so Hollywood types. Hollywood types uh, taking uh, taking E, ecstasy. taking ecstasy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an anniversary party. Like uh, Jennifer and I are uh, have recently got back together after being we're married, but we've got back together after being split up for a bit, and we have this kind of party, get all our friends over, and one of them brings ecstasy, and it all goes It's so amazing, <laughs> the sequence of, of vignettes between people, and the sense, I, I don't know how it would feel to take ecstasy, but I can only imagine that you got it exactly right, you know. <laughs> it, Guys, thanks. It, feel, it, feel, it felt like you were in the midst of what was going on with them, and yet all this painful was surfacing mm. uh, between these people. I think it was it was actually a really great thing to do because Jennifer and I, you know, she actually that's how it happened. She was being Sally Bowles and Cabaret after Natasha. She took mm. over from Natasha. Mm. And the thing, the interesting thing about um, the MC and Cabaret and Sally Bowles is they have very little little interaction. Like next week, Emma Stone is taking over, and you, you don't know, even have to meet her. I, I've never. Who is she? I'll never meet her. <laughs> no, she. Um, you know, I actually, all I do is I introduce her maybe three times, and like right now it's Michelle Williams, I smack her on the ass one time, I introduce her twice, that's it, I never see, it's a really weird structure of a, of, a, of a show where the two sort of stars never interact, and yet you kind of think they do. Um, anyway, so uh, Jennifer and I, uh, I actually went to make a movie in Italy while she was there, just by chance, and so we always felt we'd not quite, you know, connected as much as mm. we could, so we stayed friends, and when I would go to Los Angeles for things, I would go
go and stay with her and blah blah. And then we just decided we would make up a film. We wanted to do something together, so we made up this film, and we made it about people we knew, and actually we wrote for specific people, and we wrote the sort of cadences of them in the. Uh, um. Phoebe Cates. And Phoebe and Kevin Klein, and yeah. And Kevin Klein. And their kids, played their kids. and They're all in it. Yeah, and he's like someone, you know, an actor who's, she's stopped acting and has been a mom, and he's this actor, and he played a kind of a slight parody of himself. And, and, she, and you know, and I was this, I'm described in the, um, uh, by Phoebe's character as a sexually ambivalent uh, man boy or something like that. Section of the man, man child, and uh, and you know and Jennifer, we we said kind of quite brutal things about ourselves, that were things that other people had been had said, and also I think perhaps the public thought. But so it was quite it was it was brutal. You, you yeah, you but, could feel the edge of it all the yeah, time. Is yeah. there? A, did I hear somebody to say? Did they say there's going to be well, a possible? Is it possible? We were talking. We've talked about over the years that you know we'd love to do something again together because when we did, when we promoted the film, we had this saying that, you know, individually we were kind of weird, but together we made one fully functional person, Jennifer and I. <laughs> we were very, very different, but we just kind of, we a good match. And, and also she, you know, grew up in LA and Hollywood and has lived her, her life, loves it. I hate it. And so that was a good thing for the film as well because mm. it's kind of about Los Angeles and, my character wanted to get away and she wanted to stay. But anyway, uh, we've, we've talked about, and I think it would be an interesting thing, like doing like an anniversary party too, like uh, 15 years later, and who's had plastic surgery and, you know, and who's sleeping with who and whose career's gone this way. And I don't know, it, could, it would be really fascinating. And the kids, of course, would be now big adults, as they are. That's really terrifying. We were talking about that in a place earlier, which is not allowed to talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, about how it's other people's children that age you. I think it's really, yeah. it's just, you know, I had this experience when I went to um, Scotland a couple of years ago to do a play with the National Theatre of Scotland, and I, um, you know, used, I'd, meet, I'd see friends I'd not seen forever, and I'd go, how's little Johnny? And they'd go, oh, he's a doctor now. And, and I, I was in this club, and a, a, a boy came across, out of the shadows, a stunning boy came out of the shadows, and all these girls and it was all, it was, I was playing Dionysus in the back eye and all my back eye and my followers were these black girls so it was like ten black girls and me out, in a, you know, out on the town sensation and uh, <laughs> I would imagine and so we're in Glasgow in this club and this beautiful boy comes out of the shadows and, he, and all the girls were like oh he's coming to talk to me he's coming to talk to me of course he came right up to me and I was like uh huh mm, yeah. like girls. <laughs> and, he, and, he's, and he came up to me and went it's Alan, isn't it? And I was like, yes. And he went, I think he went to drama school with my parents. Oh. So that's, that's really how other people's children age. Yeah. <laughs> and I had, I had. You're listening to Alan Cumming. This is City Arts and Lectures. That I guess still. this uh, brings us to your bisexuality. We might as well just jump right Let's in there. Let's do it, yes. You're, uh, we, we've needed a few poster boys in that department, and, and you're one of them right now. Yeah. Um, talk about it. Do people do people do, or do people doubt you when you when you say you're bisexual? Um, I maybe the answer, but go ahead. Maybe. I mean, I, I think probably. I, I I just feel though, you know, I don't care. I actually don't care what people call me. I, they, I live. You know, I'm married to Grant. I'm so I'm a, I'm in a gay relationship. I'm a if people say I'm a gay man, I'm like, fine, but whatever. Uh, and, but uh, if, if I have my druthers about how I would describe myself, I would say I was bisexual, in that I, all my life, have had attraction for both men and women, I had relationships with both men and women. I mean, obviously, I'm married to Grant now, uh, but it's, like, someone today asked me about it, said, well, what do you mean? You're going, you know, you wake up every day and you're like, who, you know, we're going to have a man or a woman or... <laughs> Oh, to be so lucky. <laughs> yeah. And, and I said to him, so, like, so, and it was this nice man on the radio, and I said, so just say, if you've not had sex for a while, and he went, have you been following me? <laughs> and I said, just say, if you, if you didn't have sex for a while, would that mean you weren't, you, you wouldn't say you were straight anymore? 
Do you know, see what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. It's so stupid. And uh, it's, I just think this is, it's, I, I feel for me it's a bigger issue. It's about op- like not closing yourself off to uh, joy and, or to experience and to what you like. And I think so much in, so much in the world you, oh thanks. Especially in the, especially within the, in the gay world, we, we and I, under, I really do understand why a lot of gay people have had to maybe hide who they are, and then suddenly when they find their tribe, yeah. yet they want to be, they want to wear a uniform, and they want to have the same hair, they want yeah. to like watch the same things, they want to have the same music. They, I understand why you want to belong, I, re, I really do. But at the same time, I think that's closing yourself off to possibility and closing yourself off to really. And you can you can you can um, take on a whole set of opinions and behavioural patterns that are that are um, received rather than uh, exude from you. And I think that's something we should all be afraid of. Yeah. Jo- joining the very uh, Kiwanis Club that we thought we were leaving behind, wherever we came from. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's too. Um, I have a good straight friend who years ago marched in a pride parade with me, and he and his wife had a sign that said, "You don't have to be gay to be queer." Oh, absolutely! I totally, th- I, I really think that's like I think my mum's queer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think queer yeah. is actually not about what you do with your underpants contents. It's a sensibility. <laughs> it's a, you know what I mean? I think, yeah. I think um, there's, 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 I think queer is a, a great. Thing it means you're open and you and you're politically and socially uh, engaged and fair and decent and fun, you know. I re- <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what I want you to do? But tell us tell about uh, talking to Ian McKellen about uh, uh, Godot. Oh, oh yeah. So um, Ian McKellen. We have a mutual, mutual friend. friend, Ian McKellen, and. Um, uh, so, recently he and Patrick Stewart did uh, Waiting for Godot and uh, No Man's Land, an interplay uh, in, on Broadway, and I went to see it. And I, I, years and years ago, I did, so I did a stand-up comedy thing with another guy called Forbes, Masson, and then we did like a sitcom and blah, blah, blah. So I, I understand the concept of being in a double act, and I think what I realised from seeing the production of Waiting for Godot with Ian and Patrick was that... It's really a double. It's a. It's about a double act, it's a, and they made it very much like a vaudeville turn. And so, I was at the party afterwards, at the first night, and I saw Ian, and I said, "Gosh, I've never done this. I've never gone to see a play and actually thought in the middle of the play, I want to do this play. But tonight, I and, I, and he knew, but for he knew who Forbes was, and he knows the work we did. I said, I really would love." I realised I'd really love to do Waiting for Godot with Forbes. It'd be a great sort of, you know, cyclic thing about our relationship and the whole double act thing and the blah, blah, blah. And Ian went, well, make sure you do Patrick's part. And and I... (laughs) And, of course, I had been intending to. And And I said, I said, oh, but... I said, oh, but Ian, you know, you get all the laughs, you know, milking him, and he went, oh, I know, darling, but he's all but a part. And so Ian was totally uh, telling me which part to play in Waiting for Godot mere hours after he'd left the stage from opening it on Broadway. But I do, I do love that about him. He's kind of completely like a baby. It's you know? right there. Yeah. It's like, you know, he's got the best part. He's always got the best part. And, and, and when you try and flatter him, but you get all the laughs. He's like, I know I do. Of course I do. But he's better. <laughs> and I'm remembering the time that you and he walked down the wreck beach in Vancouver, which is the nude beach in in Vancouver. It was X-Men. It was during X-Men. We were doing X-Men, too. And Ian, in his weird way, sort of said to me, have you heard about this, um, this wreck beach? <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, you mean that nudist one? Yeah, I've heard about it. It's way long at the thing. And he goes, oh, you know, it would be quite fun to go there. What do you think? I was like... I said, and I was like, you know, are you asking me to accompany you to the nude beach? Is that what this is about? Because, well, you know, I thought, and my dog then, he lived, I lived in, the, in, in um, Vancouver and along the beach a bit. He lived, and so I'd walk my dog, honey, he, 
just died, sadly. But I'd walk her along there, and they were great friends. And, and so I, I said, do you, want, do you want to go to this near the beach? She goes, oh, no, that would be good for honey. to have a little walk down. <laughs> <laughs> we made it all about her. And so, so I go to the, the nudist beach with Ian McKellen, and it was so hard because he, all he had on was one of those kind of like hats, like a, a cricket umpire wears, like a straw hat, <laughs> totally naked. I'm like just there, I've got honey on a leash, naked, walking, and it's the funniest thing being recognised when you're naked. Because yeah. like people like go, oh, oh, and then like <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Go, oh, famous person, like that. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we went along, and it was a hilarious afternoon because Ian just loved it. He just was in his oh, element. Yeah. And he, and Every was, like, opportunity to get naked. Totally. Well, you know, he was just terrible. But I, I love that about him. I, you know, he's a really amazing person, and, you know, I sort of admire him so much on so many levels, you know, mostly because of where he has gone in terms of his life and oh. where he was about his sexuality and about his uh, public persona and to, to now being this man who is so influential and has changed so many people's lives across the world. He's, you know, absolutely an, a really influ influential person for me and also endlessly hilarious. Just endlessly. Endlessly. Um, Shall I read a funny bit? Yeah. Did I read this? No, I haven't read this yet. Please read a funny, funny bit. bit. Yeah. How are we doing for time, I missed it. Oh, we've got about five more minutes before we Perfect. talk this to is these a, nice a, people out here. This is a less grueling bit. This is, so this is right before I was about to do the BBC programme, the night before I went to London to start filming it, and I was in, well, I'll tell you. Um, Thursday, 20th of May, 2010. I'm standing on the stage of a huge marquee that houses the Cinema Against AIDS Gala in the gardens of the Hotel du Cap, just outside Cannes. I'm looking out at a sea of rich, tanned, chatty French people, all sipping champagne and gossiping to each other and ignoring me and smoking, smoking, smoking. <laughs> I should point out that I'm not alone on this stage. I'm flanked by Patti Smith and Marion Cotillard, and the three of us are just standing there and absolutely nothing is happening. Luckily, nobody in the audience is paying any of us any attention at all, and it feels like we are trapped in celebrity aspic. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, the reverie is broken by a sheepish voice that turns out to be my own, saying into the microphone, um, sorry about this delay, ladies and gentlemen. We're um, just waiting for Mary J. Blige to return to the stage so we can auction off a duet with her and Patty. Patty Smith's head whipped round towards me so fast, I actually felt a draft. <laughs> Panic made her eyes seem even more otherworldly than I'd remembered when she passed me on her way to the oh, stage see, earlier in the that. evening. Right now, she was the spitting image of one of those girls in the crucible, fresh from a hellish vision. <laughs> what? She spat. What would we even sing together? No one told me about this. <laughs> You may not know it, but Patty Smith is prone to spitting. <laughs> I first met her at a party in a New York City clothing store a couple of years earlier. She sang a few songs as cute young people in black milled around serving canapes and champagne to less cute older people in black. <laughs> it wasn't very rock and roll, but then Patty changed all that. In between two of her songs, she spat. <clears throat> Not an oops, I've got a little something stuck on my tongue kind of spit, but a great big throat-curdling gob of a spit. A loogie, as they say in the Americas. <laughs> and she spat on the carpet. Several times. No mention was made of Patty spitting by anyone in the store, least of all me, when I was taken to meet her after the performance. As we were introduced, I could see Patty sizing me up rather suspiciously with her Dickensian eyes. You're the mystery guy, aren't you? She said, pupils widening in recognition. What? I said, a little overwhelmed. You're the guy who hosts Masterpiece on PBS, aren't you? <laughs> she said, as though she herself were one of the TV detectives I did indeed introduce as Masterpiece Mystery Host. 
I was just processing the fact that Patty Smith was an avid viewer of Miss Marple and Co. <laughs> when she dealt me another body blow. I've always wanted that job, she muttered wistfully. <laughs> I made a pact with myself right there and then never to tell the masterpiece people this information, as they would surely bump me and make Patty's wish come true. <laughs> Can you imagine Patty Smith coming out of the shadows in a black suit, spouting forth about Inspector Linley or some malfeasance on the Orient Express, and ending each introduction with a resounding gob into a specially designed PBS cartoon? I can. It would be a lot more entertaining than that bloke in a suit with the funny accent they have on now. Thank you. I think we do we bring up the lights. Is that way it works for questions? Yeah. We saw you in a movie last year that we really loved. I think it was an independent movie. You played a uh, lounge singer, maybe a crossdresser. You tried to adopt a little boy, maybe in West Hollywood. It was an incredible performance. Could you narrow it down? I've done so many films like that. That's the best description I can give. No, I, I know it's, it's called Any Day Now. It actually play set in the 70s. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, about a, it's about a gay couple in the 70s who are trying to adopt a, a Down syndrome, uh, a boy with Down syndrome. And guess what? It doesn't go so well. And um, uh, so that, that's called Any Day Now. Well, number one, we thought you should have been nominated for an Academy Award. But my question is, what made you choose that role? How did you come to take that role? I just, like most things I do in my life as well as in my work, are based on my gut reaction to it and to just, I felt as soon as I read it, and I read it actually, you know, many drafts before the version that we shot, but even then I felt like completely connected to it and it was a story that in a weird way it was really because I felt that, you know, that was in the 70s, um, so much has changed and so many positive things have happened for, uh, uh, towards equality, but actually not much has changed at all. And the idea that two men now trying to adopt a child through the state system, not affluent men who could have a surrogate or buy a baby, if you, you know, to be blunt from certain things, trying to do it through the state system as these two men were, they would still face the same, potentially could still face the same prejudice and and bigotry and so that was really what was the, the draw for me was that how it was a period piece but it kind of wasn't and that was a real eye-opener for me. Hi I was wondering if you could um, relate the <laughs> hi sorry I'm standing up um, if you could relate the story of how you came to acquire the part of MC in Cabaret. Oh well so I did it first in London and like 20 years ago isn't that crazy um, I was 10 and uh, <laughs> So I, Sam Mendes, who, you know, is this director, and he was running the Dahmer Warehouse. And I was going, to, I was doing Hamlet that year, and, I, and it was going to be on a tour, and it was going to end up at the Dahmer Warehouse in London. And, um, and I knew Sam, and I was, you know, I was, I was kind of a, I'd been to the Royal Shakespeare Company, I just won an Olivia Award at the National Theatre, I was going to play Hamlet. I, was, I had a sort of trajectory, and then Sam said, would I like to do this musical? And I was sort of like, oh, no. <laughs> and so I turned it down, and then he, he really persisted, and, um, and we talked about it. And my, my whole thing about musicals is that I hate when they take subject matter that is really important and really um, about things that I find very, you know, important stories about real issues and then they do them in a kind of a, a musical way which to me demeans it's demeaning on so many levels and I just or it's either over make something over earnest when it doesn't deserve to be earnest or it demeans something that is actually really important and it makes it into something frothy so I have, I have big issues and I still do have issues about musicals I, I don't think necessarily um, certain material is the best way to be uh, dealt with in a musical form. 
Um, but, I, but I realized that cabaret and the way that Sam wanted to do it and making it kind of much more sort of back to the Christopher and his kind and the, yeah. the Berlin stories and to, and to actually make it a bit more down and dirty and to make it, it was actually one of the first immersive theater experiences that people, that's quite a common word nowadays, but you, you come into this theater, which is like being at a club and little lights on the tables and you are at the club and it's, it's, uh, it, it, it transforms your experience. So I, I was won over by that and by the way that he wanted the character of the MC to be the kind of masthead of the production and to be kind of this, you know, puppeteer f for the audience. And I am, um, so then I, so I did it. I did it in London and, um, and it went very well. And then, you know, they were like, oh, you know, they want to do it on Broadway. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And um, so we finished it in like March of 94 in London. It was just a short run. And then it wasn't until 1998 that it opened on Broadway. And then so I did it then. And now I'm doing it again. And so, and I'm in, so it's 16 years since I did it last time. And in 16 years time, I will be fifth, uh, 66. <laughs> So I've decided I'm going to play Fräulein Schneider in the next Broadway production. I could pull it off. Because I don't think I could do the kick line. I don't think I could do the kick line when I'm 66. I bet you will. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I meant to ask you earlier, might as well ask it in public, was Judy Dench the very first Sally Bowles? In London, in London when they did Cabaret first, uh, she was the first Sally Bowles, yeah. In, in the musical of Cabaret, yeah. Doesn't that give you the span of the... I know. Amazing work of yeah. art. Yeah, Emma keeps Stone living. is going to be playing a part that Judy Dench yeah. first played. Yeah. That nuts. This question oh. is in the back of the orchestra, towards your right. Uh, first, I really want to thank you for coming out while, um, no pun intended, uh, while, uh, while uh, I do doing Cambrai yeah. in New York and flying out to San Francisco and back to New York. Um, I'm, I saw you on Broadway this summer, and I'm a big fan of The Good Wife, and I was wondering, how do you juggle doing a show from, I assume, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and a day job with The Good Wife? Well, it's quite difficult, and um, I, you know, sometimes it's a mad dash to the theater, but I don't work every day on The Good Wife, and I just, I had, I had an episode off when my book first came out to kind of be able to do all the press stuff, um, and I, I, I actually, I got, I managed to get in this year in my contract that I had every other Monday and Tuesday off. So it means that at least I have one weekend every two weeks that I can be off both um, Cabaret and The Good Wife. And that's why I'm able to be here. And that's why my book tour is basically on my days off, uh, the weekends. <laughs> so, but that's just, the, you know, that's kind of rich arty white people's problems in a way <laughs> I've got these great things I'm doing and it's not ideal but it's um it's it's just the way it is and and I and I have you know really great people helping me Jimmy my assistant is here who just you know has scheduling nightmares all the time because we are we, you don't get the schedule for the good wife until I mean the cabaret is pretty set you know what you know what time the show is going to be every night but the good wife we like there's a new episode started uh, is this Monday? Yeah, today, and you have to start it today, and I got the script on Thursday, and we got the schedule on Friday. So on Friday, we were able to know what I was doing for the next two weeks. But it's like that. Every, you know, basically the night before, you, you know what you're doing for the next two weeks, and, and that's all right, but it's... Uh, it's it can be, you know, it, it, it's, it's problematic. So basically, this is your dark night. Yeah, tonight's my dark night. I'm flying back tomorrow... Yeah. I get picked up at 5.20 a.m. and I'll be doing a show on Broadway tomorrow evening. You're but right. I'll sleep on the plane. This will be the final question from the center of the balcony. Better make it good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, I wanted to start by saying every character that you play is such is delectable. It's such a meaty delight and um, usually it has such a mischievous twist of your eyebrow, of your smile, or of anything. So I'm curious, what's the most, the character you've played that's the most different from yourself? And have you preferred that to the characters that we assume are most like you, or is, are those quite difficult for you? 
I think actually most people I've, over the years, have, I've, when I play quite, you know, extravagant, loud, showy offy people, I think people think that's most like who I am. And it really isn't. I mean, I, I, I hate, like, you know, in a bar, I don't know, I, I just don't like standing up and speaking or something. I don't, it's, that's not really me. I, I like having fun, but I'm not kind of the, the loud person in the corner shouting. So when I do play parts like that, I, I enjoy them, um, but they're not really... I, I think perhaps it's a misconception about me that people think I'm actually like that. I'm not really. Um, but I actually think, like, you know, I've, I've played a lot of sort of fantastical people, people who are... even people who are not human. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of characters that are almost like... almost kind of like comic book... Uh, and literally sometimes comic book people... <laughs> But uh, sort of heightened, heightened um, senses of reality, and I really enjoy those. And I kind of managed to, you know, it's not a big leap for me to do that. But when I started doing the Good Wife, and I, 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 I thought, gosh, you know, I don't, I don't know how to be like a middle-aged man in a suit. I, I don't, I don't have any connections to that. Even though, you know, standing there, I was a middle-aged man in a suit. <laughs> um, and in a funny way, I, I, I realised that. Eli is just as crazy and fantastical and kind of cartoonish, actually, as all those other people. And I, I, it made me realise that um, every part you play, uh, you bring something of yourself to. And obviously, there's something obviously of Eli in me. I, I am, I embody him. And but he is so far removed from who I am and who, how I live my life. I don't think I would even like him very much in real life. I mean, I'd be scared of him first of all. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to, want to hang out with him. But I do. I am very fond of him now. But I actually think, to answer your question, I do feel that he is the biggest person of a real person away from me that it could possibly be. But in playing him, I realise that I am quite like him, and I'm actually like all those people, all these all these characters I've played, as crazy and big and otherworldly as they are. They are just like Eli. They're they're all in my you know gallery of grotesques. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Alan Cumming. This program was recorded at the North Theatre in San Francisco on November 3rd, 2014. These broadcasts are produced by City Arts and Lectures in association with K.